VGS 91.9 The Buzz. I'm your host, Big Chris. Uh, thank y'all so much for tuning back in. Uh, we got a really good show for y'all this evening, man. Like we said before, every week we got a new topic and a lot of th different things that we're talking about each and every week. Uh, but basically, the basis of the show is we talked about manhood uh, on all levels, man, especially everything that's uh, affecting us in our communities. We're really trying to figure out exactly what we're supposed to be doing with all this uh, pol uh, politics is going around, economics. We talk about capitalism. We talk about family issues. We talk about everything up under the sun and what men are supposed to be doing in our communities, man. So basically for this show, this is our contribution to our community. And we have a very special um, show for y'all, man. We're going to have a really good dialogue. I know a lot of people have asked not only for the manhood mindset, but we want a woman's perspective on manhood in our community, man, because we want to make sure that we include as many voices as possible and see how they see manhood and see exactly what we're supposed to be trying to do moving forward, all right? So, like I said before, my, my name is Big Chris from Atlanta area, man. I grew up in Ellawood, South Dakota County, man, Cedar Grove uh, High School representative, of course, uh, to the day that uh they cancel all my records all right <laughs> uh, but thank y'all so much for tuning in man so we're gonna uh we're gonna let everybody introduce themselves man true we're gonna start with you doc true amir uh rapper writer uh what's what's the word for doing poems spoken word artist spoken word artist yeah yeah i don't do those <laughs> it's not poet <laughs> I don't do those often, but I do do poetry. I, that's what I was going to say, but I was like, that's not the word. But anyways, um, yeah, I am a leader in rap, well, the original number of rap, writing master poetry. We meet on Thursdays. Um, for any of that information, you can hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, T-R-U-U-A-M-I-R. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. All right, who else we got in the building? I guess I'll go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not a stranger. I was on the show last week. Once again, my name is James Thomas. I am a doctoral student here in public health, uh, community health behavior and education program. I'm also a TA. I teach intro to community health. Shout out to all my students. Hope y'all studying. Um, <laughs> they're not studying, bro. They're not studying. No, they're not. Not that they're listening to the show, they're not. Yep. But, um, <laughs> they can multitask. <laughs> they can multi-cheat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... Um, I'm no stranger to GSU, been at GSU for quite a while. I got my undergrad here and my master's in public health as well. And um, yeah, that's it. That's what's up. That's what's up. And last but certainly not least, and the reason why we have our show today. Right. That's what's up. Please introduce yourself. So I guess I am a stranger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not really. In, in the booth, maybe. But right. I'm a stranger real, to this real, setting. In real life, you fam. You know what Some I mean? Some people know me, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, my name is Deja Dukes, and I am um, a woman, clearly. Outnumbered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Exactly. I'm a triple minority. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about it in a second. But, um, yeah, my name is Deja. I am a mental health therapist. I actually work here at the Counseling Center as a therapist. Um, sure. But I'm not new to Georgia Southern as well. I'm, I'm a double eagle. I did get my undergraduate degree in psychology here and my master's in clinical mental health counseling here. Gotcha. Um, and now I work here. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. All right. Yeah. All righty. Well, um, 
Well, let's just um, let's get into it, shall we? Uh, just just in case some people were not here last week, let's go ahead and give them a brief description of what we talked about last week and what's the reason why we wanted to move into the topic, more like a part two. So, uh, James, we're going to start with you, man, and then, right. True, I want you to chime in, and then, Daisy, we're going to let you know what direction we're heading, and then we want you to lower the boom. All right. All right, James, what, do we, what were we talking about last week, bro? Uh, just to do a brief recap of last week, last week we kind of got into some things talking about masculinity. Um, we started off talking about toxic masculinity and defining that, and what does masculinity mean to us as an individual. Right. And then I got into, you know, some of the dynamics of my dissertation, right. which is still in the works, but we, you know, we're breaking the groundwork for that. For sure. And um, one of the things that I'm looking at is black masculinity and how it relates to health behavior. Right. Because I'm in public health. And one of the interesting things I found out was that black, you know, across ethnic backgrounds, we all have different definitions of masculinity. Right. And one of the interesting things I found out is that black men, um, in the study that I read, they define masculinity more so by how the family values them, how their wife values them, how their children value them, how they're seen in the community as a pillar in the community. Okay. Um, and spirituality also ties into that as well. Um, having a connection with God or higher power or whatever this person believes in their belief system. Okay. All of that is combined into their per into their perception or their view of masculinity. Okay. Um, so basically, in my dissertation, one thing I'm looking at is how do these components that black men use um, tie into their health behavior? Because one of the things that we know is that health of black men is in a crisis state. Okay. And what I mean by that is that we tend to have less favorable outcomes than men of other groups. Okay. Uh, we have least... Uh, we have lower life expectancies, we have lower quality of life, we're more likely to be diagnosed with chronic diseases. Um, and one of the interesting things that I found out, you know, in public health, they'll always tell you, the more money that you make, the more likely you are to be healthier. The hmm. crazy thing about it is that you can have a white male who makes $25,000 a year mm -hmm. and a black male who makes $100,000 a year, but the white male who makes $25,000 a year is still more likely to be healthier than the black male who makes a hundred thousand a year so, so that's one of the things that we need to look at is why is it that black men are not as healthy as other groups and one of the things that we found in research is that african americans in general we don't have a lot of research directly um research that's directed directly at us we got media that's directed at us right but not research right most of the research that we know especially health wise that we know about african americans right are kind of like sub studies is like this is what we really looked at and I, by the way african americans do this or african americans are more likely to do this right and that's really not serving our people or my people any 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 good and that's one of the things that's is a really big gap in research okay. of oh okay what do black men differ in ways okay. than other groups and how do we find out these things and how they differ and how do we use that to address health concerns and health needs? Okay. Because that's clearly not going on. There are some efforts to do that, but there still needs to be more work in that. Mm. And that's just the one of the facets of how masculinity and manhood is so important <clears throat> to know about, especially in the black community, is okay. because our health is related to it. Right. Right. And um, that's just a very important piece. And that's one of the things I'm hoping to open the door for for my dissertation. I'm not trying to save the world. But I'm at least trying to start a conversation to save it. Save, save somebody. somebody. Yeah. Save somebody. All right. right. True. What, do, what are some of the things that we mentioned last week kind of, that you kind of want us to elaborate on tonight and help somebody out with? What do you remember about last week or a feeling about last week? Primarily uh, the conversation that James just brought up. Um, just speaking, I don't really want to go too deep in male toxic masculinity, but I do want to get your opinions on what you view as uh, toxic masculinity, that's Deja, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and how that does affect you or how you see it affects men in your life or around your life, whatever, whatever. Um, that's pretty much the bulk of the conversation along with what James was just mentioning for sure. last week. For sure, for sure. And I think uh, one of the things that stuck out to me is uh, sometimes uh, toxic masculinity is not necessarily what we see in people but what is actually expected of people 
uh, we talked about how sometimes masculinity is almost uh, a wager uh, of acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so we talked about last week, like where somebody says you're not a real man, and then they fill in the blank with something that they want you to do, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or they'll put some type of expectation over you and say, well, in my family, you're not a man until you do this, and then they go and force it right mm -hmm. and one of the things we talked about man just because we're the same skin tone don't mean we're the same culture yeah. we may have similar treatment and sometimes we turn our treatment into a culture our reaction to that treatment so we may have we may be looked at uh, uh looked upon the same way in our in our society right so people with dark skin are used, have been histor historically mistreated mm -hmm. you know and just in the world period mm -hmm. um but our mistreatment is not necessarily our identity, mm -hmm. right? And so sometimes we need to at least have that that dialogue to see where we can navigate through that so we won't be as confused. So we're really talking to little kids right now. So say, for instance, mm -hmm. we just pretend like it's a like an 8 to 12-year-old listening right now. So if some people may, not, may know what we're talking about, we're going to try to break it down for somebody who's just not getting into it, seeing stuff on TV, um, maybe in, in turmoil with their own parents, maybe in turmoil with their own teachers and administrators at the elementary school and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So. Uh, based on what you've heard so far, mm -hmm. uh, it was extremely requested that we have a woman's point of view on manhood because a lot of people don't understand how either the lack of manhood or the misrepre misrepresentation of manhood, what that can do to women's, uh, to a woman's mindset. Mm -hmm. So just what are your thoughts on what you've, what you've heard us talk about so far and, and educate us? What's mm -hmm. up? One, I like to say um, it is a big responsibility to speak on behalf of our women. No, you're not. Um, let, me, let, me, let me clear that. people that agree with you okay so Go i just ahead. got a lot of questions um sure. so i guess the first question that stands out to me is kind of like how i see manhood or yeah. what i see it as um and right now as it stands right now i see it as a hindrance okay. to black men i see it as a constraint it's okay. something that boxes you in it's just like the idea of like what it is to be black and i feel like as a culture now we're trying to expand that with the immersion of like the awkward black girl and the different kind of definitions mm -hmm. of what it means to be black saying there's not just one way to be that right. because when we put people in boxes like that you know we constrain people we don't allow people to be the totality and truth of who they are right so manhood as it is right now I see it as a constraint because we're not allowing room for people to create that for the per the individual okay um, and that starts from it does start from the family so if I'm talking to an 8 to 12 year old you know and this is partially why I work with the population that I do because it's hard because when you're working with a child you don't get to just work with that child yeah you gotta work with the environment you too, gotta work you? with the environment that sucks and, <laughs> and you know real. I can do I can do all kind of work in my office with you, but you got to go back into your environment. Yes. And even in, you know, with college counseling, I work with students and then they go home for Thanksgiving break. They go home for Christmas break and everything that we worked on just gets reversed. Yeah. So it's hard. So I wouldn't talk to that eight or 12 year old. I would talk to their parents and try to talk to them about how it's important to let your child be who they are. Let them define manhood for them. Um, so yeah, I see it right now as a constraint, but I, you know, I'm appreciative and grateful that you guys are having these conversations sure. to kind of pull on that a little bit and right. show people that you know it can be whatever you want it to be. There isn't one definition, just like womanhood. Like I feel like women right now, you know, it's real cool to be a black woman. Like we in like a special little club right now, For sure. For you sure. know, like we glittering and stuff because sure. we all out here telling each other like, yes, yeah, sis, do what you want to do, go yeah. be that, go do that. And so I would hope, I really hope for our counterparts to move toward that space with each other as well, For sure. but allowing each other that freedom and taking off those constraints that have been on you guys for so long um to really formulate that for yourselves does that make sense heck yeah i really I, go ahead bro go ahead i'm glad that you said that about black women being in this space where they're like celebrating you know their sisters or and i say sisters figuratively but like just celebrating other black women but i i feel like the reason i said i'm glad you said that because i feel that black men are finally in that space as well where you're not 
looking at the guy beside you as competition. Not it's not totally gone, but I, I do see it more now where it's like black men are not looking at other black men as a threat. Right. Or competition to mm-hmm. it's like, well if he's shining I gotta outshine him. You know what I'm saying? It's like we're more so as a people kinda celebrating each other even more so and celebrating the things that we're accomplishing even more so. I, I had a partner that recently made a a, a point about children growing up like uh, our generation, I seen this in a meme. He didn't make this point. I get to his point in a second. But our generation, uh, I feel as though we're the generation where we're really like putting a foot down. Like, yo, we're not dealing with the toxicity that our parents bring into the household. Whatever, mm-hmm. whatever. We're, we're very conscious and acknowledge like how oppressed we are, just as people, not just as your personal struggles as a woman or my personal struggles mm-hmm. as a guy. Right. Just like your emotional things you might have went through in your household. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. and, and how the generation before us, they didn't feel a need to tend to those, you know, issues right. or whatever, whatever. Right. Like to make a light joke of it, um, it was a meme of Rudolph. Yeah. And, you know, Santa Claus came up to him was like, Yo, I need you to, you know, lead the slate. And Rudolph, you know, said something extremely woke like um, you're not just gonna objectify me and, and yeah. just use me for the time but mm-hmm. like I feel like our generation now is finally at that point where we're acknowledging those things and now we're instill, instilling that into the children that are coming from us yeah. so where these kids, this is the point my homeboy made, these kids are now growing up less homophobic because we're having these conversations about homophobia, mm-hmm. you know what I mean and we're having these conversations about transphobia and yeah it, it stirs the pot and it causes these issues but that dialogue creates that yeah you know, it pulls on those constraints yeah. it loosens them a little bit but i would ask this question to you do you think there is some level um depending on your socioeconomic status that contributes to you being able to um liberate yourself to that point yeah definitely that plays a part okay <laughs> so um like all of us in here are college educated correct mm-hmm. yeah okay to an extent i didn't finish but Oh, well, I mean, you here, you was a part, yeah. you know, and the people you're around are college, edu- college educated. So, yeah, we are, because we live in the hub of where we have those conversations intentionally. Like, we live in a space where dialogue is encouraged and challenging things are encouraged. Like, that is kind of like the central meaning of going to college, right? Mm-hmm. We're introduced to all these people. Um, I'm first generation college student in my family. So if I go back to when I first came back to college, it's kind of like I had drank the Kool-Aid on a, on a bunch of stuff when it came to yeah. limits that were on me, limits that I put on other people, my thoughts on homophobia, my, uh, homosexuality, um, sexuality in general, my own and others, right? But because I feel like a part of my evolution came from the population of people that I, that I was around, right? So it, sometimes when we, the educated peoples or people who've college educated people, sometimes we can get into our little cluster and think that because we are progressing in a certain way, the world as a whole is progressing in a certain way. Yeah. When really it's just that we keep ourselves kind of isolated or um, we live in a microcosm. Yeah. Um, so if we were to go, because if I go back to my community where I came from, the same progress that you're talking about ain't there. Yeah, that, I agree with that as well. But like, like you said, you came from that kind of neighborhood. You was you, you was a first generation college student. Same here. Mm-hmm. Me and my my brothers and sisters, like we would. My sister was the first one to finish college. My my father did go to college, but he didn't finish. My mother didn't finish. She went to community college. Whatever, whatever. But my sister was the first one to finish. I didn't, but I did go to school. Whatever. Um, my younger brothers in FI FIU now. And that's a big deal mm-hmm. for him to be in FIU since mm-hmm. it's a school. But, <laughs> but um, like, so I do get it. But like, like I was saying, your point, you came from an environment where you took whatever opportunities was in front of you to change that outcome that preceded you mm-hmm. or whatever. I do feel as though school, yes, it's a safety net. You live in, inside of this bubble to where you go back home during Christmas break or Thanksgiving break and you start talking all this woke mess and, you know, you find out how homophobic your uncle is or something like that you know what i'm saying like you it really shines to you now because of the things that you learn whatever whatever yeah. and i'm not saying I, I use that as a example my uncle is not homophobic but <laughs> um even if he was it's okay we all come from somewhere yeah, we gotta start we somewhere come, but i just want to do, you, do y'all mind elaborate on the word phobic for people who may hear that word but they don't understand the i guess the whole implication of the word phobic can y'all Phobic, just to break it down for an eight to twelve year old, is fear of. Okay. That's what I was gonna say. Okay. So, fear homophobic fear of homophobia. It's a it's a, it's a, it's a sense of prejudice towards 
those kind of people. I don't like putting it in, in that wording, but like that's what it is, a form of prejudice. Just like you have a prejudice of black people or whatever. And for the people who like say for instance, you got a lot of people out there that may not understand it, but they don't necessarily hate it or fear it. Mm -hmm. But they don't necessarily uh, fall in line with the belief system or or the uh, a lot of people think it's a belief some people think it's a habit some people think it's a human activity mm -hmm. some people think it's an identity a lot of people one thing I really find out about a lot of the stuff we're talking about a mm -hmm. lot of people get their information from TV mm -hmm. yeah. movies reality shows mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying to me that's still prejudice and, yeah. and dissonance right 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 and mm -hmm. it was, see this is the thing so some of us have been um, have had conversations with people who may self-identify with that culture background, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of us have never ever talked to a human being. We just only seen what's been projected on the screen. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know is that screen has producers, editors, actors. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get paid to yeah. project that type of image on the screen, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, as far as that phobia, what's the difference between phobia and I just don't personally align with that culture? What's the difference? I think... I don't align is um, prejudice. It is prejudice. Yeah. Okay. So phobia is literally a. It's hard for me because I think if we boil anything down, most times at its base there is a fear there. Okay. A fear that you know what I've been taught all my life is wrong. A fear that I'm wrong. A fear mm -hmm. that I could be something different. Right. Just if we go deeper than mm -hmm. what we're saying, I right. think at the base it's all fear. Right. But. Um, yeah, I think, but if you describe it like, I just don't agree with blank, or that's right. just, and it, and it really isn't about your belief system, it's about how you act. Right. So if you say, I don't agree with blank, so therefore I don't talk to blank, or I don't go blank, then that's prejudice and discrimination. Okay. All right. And, and James, I want you to chime in on this, because we, like, some of the words that we're using, we ha I know I, it may be a definition and some the things that help me out. A definition is something that we can all reference, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A meaning is something dealing with our history, our personal experiences, yeah. all and what things that make sense to us so we can actually move on with our lives, right? So meanings and definitions often conflict mm -hmm. based off my experiences. It's mm -hmm. not true for everybody, mm -hmm. but sometimes something means something to me and it's defined something different. I'm like, nah, I didn't see that. And that's why we have <laughs> operational definitions. There right. is the definition of whatever. The operational right. is how am I using this definition? Right. And a lot of times people don't understand that the definition came from people who had enough power to edit the dictionary. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what I'm saying? So, we're still ultimately taking their word for it yeah. based off their experiences and the people yeah. they talk to, right? Right. So, that's the reason why we have these, you know, these types of discussions. And and honestly, with manhood mindset, it's not necessarily something to, to agree with. We ain't trying to program nobody. Mm -hmm. it's, it's I think it's just healthy for us to at least say, man, I don't agree with that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Man, I really don't agree with that. But I know why. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think people, some some of us fall into a situation where we disagree because it feels good just to be that dude that disagreed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? But I find out the older I got, I like, it's not, that's, that's not enough just to disagree. I get how of knowing why. Like people that so always you can, want to play devil's advocate. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Just because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> James, back to you, man. Like, say for instance, what's the difference between, in your opinion, and what you researched so far? You know what I'm saying? And I know you talked about uh, a lot of black male experiences especially in higher education and coping mechanisms with stress right mm -hmm. and a lot of that stress is based on identity right a lot of that stress based off environmental factors as well right mm -hmm. so dealing with necessarily quote unquote something that you may be scared of and something that you know what this is just not that's not beneficial to me I don't line up with that cultural uh, expression background or that type of information mm -hmm. how do you differentiate the two and what have you seen so far in your studies and Deja, I want you to respond to what you're hearing. Okay. All right. Um, funny thing is, I was just lecturing last, last when was it? Last week. And um, the lecture was on community organizing. And three of the terms that we used was cultural sensitivity, cultural humility, and cultural competence. Mm -hmm. And basically, the three of those is understanding, appreciating, and um, being able to not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to be a part of somebody else's culture, mm -hmm. but you understand it and you respect it. Right. Um, the problem with today's, um, I guess, population, and that's one of the things I'm looking at as well, is that a lot of African-American males, and just using the, this group as an example, mm -hmm. when we come to an, a new area or a new environment, mm -hmm. um, 
cultural competence is not necessarily used. And what I mean by cultural competence is understanding somebody else's culture. Gotcha. So a lot of times, and even other students of color in general, they come to a university or any type of new setting, they don't feel understood. They don't feel like um, maybe they are connected to the school mm -hmm. or they don't feel like the school is a place for them. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we, you know, we kind of look at is, okay, if I don't feel a part of something, I have to find some type of way to cope with this lack of. With that, do you mean like college period or just PWIs? Um, it can depend. It can depend because say you are an African American who went to a predominantly white high school, now you go to an HBCU. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, it could depend yeah. between the two. Or you're a first generation college student. Right. And so you don't understand the college right. environment or community in general. And now you represent the family too. Right. Your mama yeah. set right. you up there. Because yeah. the thing <laughs> is, you could, be, you could be black, you could be from a black family, went to a predominantly black high school, but you're right. a first generation college student. Mm -hmm. You go to a new environment, you don't know anything about financial aid. Right. You don't know anything about scholarships. You don't know how to sign and register for classes. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that we're, we're really looking at or finding is that because of people not feeling connected to a certain environment, somebody has to come up with some type of coping mechanism to make up for that lack of mm. feeling connected. Okay. So um, this is where we get into bad health behaviors. This is where you get into um, unprotected sex. This is where you get into binge drinking. This is where you get into eating um, a lot of bad food. Chicken tenders. Right. Um, not getting enough. You gotta sing it, bro. You gotta sing it. Um, not getting they enough everywhere, sleep. bro. They um, everywhere. Just doing other risky behaviors that can really put you in bad situations. Right. Right. So, um, I think going back to your question about you know fear of or not really knowing a lot of you know a lot of information about somebody's background, somebody's culture. Mm -hmm. um, as far as other areas, I I can see it and I can view it, but I can definitely attest to the African American male experience. Um, for example, there was a couple years ago, I think it was at Georgia State, there was an African-American male student who was trying to talk to his advisor about dropping a class or signing up for a class. Right. And she interpreted it as, you know, every time he would come to the office, she wasn't there, but she would interpret it as he's harassing me. See, and she's an advisor. Right. See. And she comes out, you know, luckily he recorded on his phone, but she's like, you know, you've been harassing me. And he's like, no, he's trying to get help for a class. You work there. Right. right. <laughs> God, the common sense. Right. Please even, download it. Even um, a couple, let's see, a couple weeks ago, it was a, a young African-American man who went to Old Navy, I believe, uh, one of the stores. And he had on a, a bubble jacket or a bubble vest that he bought from the store previously. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they didn't believe that he bought it before then, so they made him take it off. They was like, you know, are you going to pay for this? So he had to go back and prove, you know, had them pull the tape and prove that he had on the jacket when he walked in the store. Okay. And these just small types of experiences is basically, you know, just one type of example of what happens when we don't understand other people and we don't try to understand other people. Um, it creates some type of chaos in that person's life right. where they have to find a, an outlet or some type of coping mechanism to deal with life. Right. And a lot of times these coping mechanisms are unhealthy in the ways that we deal with mm -hmm. people not understanding us. But one of the best things about coming to college is that you learn a lot about yourself. And one of the liberating things about you know college and being around like-minded people is that you learn who you are and you have your own expectations for yourself and you kind of you know the expectations of the world are still out there but you right. you slowly fade those expectations out and you really start to embrace who you are as a person gotcha and that's where the healthy coping mechanisms start to come in this is where you get you know people who may express themselves through art or poetry. This is where you get, you know, random acts of poetry, people mm -hmm. expressing themselves, mm -hmm. or just different types of, of other activities that people may use to, to do that type of thing. Deja, and when you in the counseling center and you in, engage with um, men, period, mm -hmm. um, and then I want you to talk about specifically men who may identify as being black or mm -hmm. non-white or mm -hmm. any man who may be under any type of level of uh i'm gonna say just oppression or any type of difficulty based Person on of how color. They look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah um what have you seen mm -hmm. and what do you think is needed from what your, from your point of, not only a clinician but a woman 
Okay. So I meant to say this earlier, and I think you asked me the question about how manhood today affects me as a woman. Yes, yes. I want you to go in on that, please. Um, so as a heterosexual woman, cisgender heterosexual woman, who, um, of course, has relations with men, at the constraints that are on a cisgender heterosexual males right and now. what's cisgender to the eight-year-old who's listening? <laughs> cisgender means you identify as the sex that you were born into. Okay. So, straight. So, young man, if you were born a, if you were born a boy and you identify as a boy, because some of them you have feel never, internally, ever heard right? You feel before, internally right? like you identify as male, right. and you were born with male genitalia, then you are cisgendered. And that's going to be confusing because he was like, "Why wouldn't I feel that way?" And then that's when we go into all of those different that's things. The, yeah. Right? So, <laughs> but that's and, and, and do has relations with cisgender heterosexual males yeah. um the way that manhood or masculinity is set up right now and also the way that even some ways that femininity is set up set up right now makes it impossible for us to be in relation with each other i won't yeah we were going in there anyway enjoy <laughs> just keep going <laughs> just keep because i was going to ask you to uh, chime in on the relationship between men and women today yeah it almost we'll makes going. it impossible for us to be in relation with each other and i right. say that before i say this because therapy is just a microcosm of the world right so of course it's different because our relationship is different we don't hang out outside of that room we don't really exist outside of that room but in that room the world comes in there with us so I'm still a female when I work with my male clients whether they're of color or um, from the majority culture um, and I say that because we as a culture don't allow men as it is right now to really healthily express and explore their emotion as children mm -hmm. so when they get to us you know, women, we, we have a privilege in that way. We get to explore that. Like, that's not something. Black women, it's a little, it's a little testy for us. But we still get to do it mm -hmm. more than men get to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So by the time we get to this age, we're a little bit more in tune and up to what's going on with us. And we can communicate that with someone else. And we kind of are a little bit more aware of what we need. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, I feel like the male counterparts don't get that. Okay. So a lot of times they come in, and I was talking to my friends about this, they come in with armor, and this is in my personal life, this is in therapy, whatever, okay. and it's like I'm trying to disarm them, take down all of these walls, take down all of these defenses to get to the little boy behind there who needs to be talked to. Okay. Who needs? Who didn't get the opportunity to grow up, but had to put on a man's clothes, had to put on man's clothes, but he really didn't get the opportunity to grow into these clothes. Um and so and for some and that happens for women as well but i think it happens more globally for men just because of masculinity and the stereotypes that we put on men in that way gotcha so a lot of in you know in a lot of times you you were taught that emotions were something that were used against you growing up so when you get into a relationship with a woman who's like that's how i need you to relate to me is emotionally mm -hmm. you're like that's dangerous i'm not gonna do that that's like giving especially you especially if they throw it back on you though Right, and that's but, what yeah. Like, but the fact everything that she mentioned creates that fear. Exactly, that's true. exactly, and that's, that's what I'm true. saying. And she and she knows that, you mm -hmm. know. And maybe there's something. There's a little girl in her as well that's not mature enough to be able to be in communication with someone and know that it's not something that you throw back and forth in somebody's yeah, face. You. you know what I'm saying? So because then the trust is gone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. then at the same time, at, as a counterpart of that whole system existing and creating that within men. To a certain extent, it's created that same notion within your mind to where you could weaponize that, like just out of anger or frustration or whatever, and, and whatever argument y'all are getting in because it's ingrained in you to a certain extent as much as it is ingrained in him from birth growing up, you know, to, to the same. Oh, you just got hit resume. Yeah. Just hit dismiss right there and hit resume. It's T Mobile. It don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> it, it, it's, it back up. And the, the bill is on time every time. They don't care. <laughs> <laughs> now it's just like you, you've been with us for years. Now you got to pay twice. <laughs> pay with your money. But, um, it's, to a certain extent, it's ingrained in your mind just as much as it is ingrained in him. Just, you know, throughout his different stages and motions in life. So it's, it's something that's hard to fight. For both parties, it's way harder for the guy because you know you've been constantly told to suck it up, well, man, man up, whatever, whatever. But 
I think it's hard in different ways because, yeah, you've been taught that way, but women have also been taught a certain way that they're supposed to communicate with men. True. Which is not healthy, yeah. which is just to kind of, you know, I'm in a room full of men, but cater to his ego. We're on the same squad. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, cater to his ego and kind of lessen yourself to make it easier for him, which, of course, depreciates the woman. But that's what I'm saying is all of that is a byproduct of what you was originally yes. saying. Yes, right. we are all victims of the system. <laughs> I will ask that you. That's what I say. Person, fellas, I want you to uh, respond to what she's saying. Mm -hmm. All right, you talked about um, it may not be healthy the way we were raised, right? Mm -hmm. So now we, we hopefully. Uh, a lot of us are getting more and more exposed to history. It's not guaranteed, but your history is based on what you're exposed to and what you go look for, right? Mm -hmm. Now, granted, our historical experience in this land over here has been kind of traumatic, to yes. say the least, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the way we were raised, could it be uh, because we were trying to survive a specific environment? And the reason Absolutely. Why, and the reason why I say this is because, let's say, for instance, we were all in the armed forces, right? Mm-hmm. Would you train the Navy the exact same way you train the Air Force? No. That has so many layers to this. I know. I know. But I'm not. And, and I'm not. I, no, I'm saying that's a good thing. I, I did it for it I did so it for many. understanding that comparison. I want to be clear just in case somebody. No, like, I get exactly what you're saying. I get exactly but what you're it, saying. But honestly, folks that look like us have literally been terrorized. We've been in a war zone. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we didn't have time to cater to nobody's feelings and right. teach you how to take deal with your feelings when I got to make sure you eat and you got a roof over your head. Right. So in therapy, there's this concept called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. Y'all, right. y'all, I know oh, you heard you. about it. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, Maslow's yeah. hierarchy of needs. So it basically talks about how different needs need to be met in order for certain things to take place. Right. And at the very basis of this pyramid, because it's a pyramid, look it up if you want to, um, is shelter, food. Just like basic survival, like right. shelter and food. And so if you don't have shelter and food, and then it, it moves up. So like the first one is shelter and food. Then it's like relationships. Mm -hmm. Then it's like, um, I don't know. I can't remember recreational things and then mm -hmm. at the top is like self-actualization right so that's like taking the time to really get to know yourself and become an evolved human being right right but basically the concept is if those bottom tier things aren't met those top tier things can't happen exactly. and so in the african-american community we've been trying to get that bottom tier stuff for a long time while our counterparts was already three steps ahead of us in and that the bottom tiers are <laughs> and i was i saw something today about in savannah it is it's a part of savannah that their water is worse than flint mm. i just yeah, saw I it saw on it. facebook yeah, today and so now we're talking based off what i've been told i can't prove this so mm -hmm. let me let me clarify that mm -hmm. that's predominantly african-american part of town yeah right mm -hmm. so now we start talking about survival yeah right mm -hmm. and regardless when somebody's messing with your Hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. food, water, shelter, right? Yeah, you can't do those upper level things, which is when, you know, oppression and privilege and all those things come in and make yes. everything multi-layered. Like you can't have, we can't have this conversation without it being multi-layered. I know, and then we you talked know? about, and, and True brings capitalism every week. Okay. He said, you can't talk about none of this. Unless you mention some form of capitalism because it's always at the base of it. Right. And a lot of people don't understand is on the hierarchy of needs of oppression, the bottom part is capitalism. It starts with that. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because you can't mistreat without trying to capitalize on somebody. Right. You got to be getting over like with somebody. Like somebody got to be mentioning that whole, you yeah. know, that what's, what's the chart called again? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The, the, with the whole hierarchy of needs thing, right? And you being stuck in this rut of trying to get that bottom layer when you factor in capitalism into it like i know y'all have seen you know the viral post or whatever where somebody some politician to say something and somebody will retweet it with you know right. a sarcastic remark but it's the truth right. it's like when you look at look at minimum wage mm. with, with what it's at but the price of living where you live it live at is like you need twelve hundred dollars a week in order to just get the basic essentials mm -hmm. you know what i mean but but you're getting paid ten dollars an hour exactly you know what i mean so mm -hmm. it's like that plays into the whole part of it does and to go back to the point that i think chris was trying to make is we have generations of that so we don't just have um 
and generations of that not even in this like evolved world that we live in now but you know of course it goes back to slavery you can't mm-hmm. talk about them and don't not going back to slavery so from then we've just been trying to survive right. right and so a lot of the things that we learned or we gained a lot of the behaviors and thought processes and all that stuff that we got during slavery have just been passed down mm-hmm. um and it takes a certain level of privilege which is why i was talking about earlier um you know being college educated that is a privilege and we we get to sit in a certain circle of people right because the fact that we're here means something about the people who got us here mm-hmm. it means something about them you know it may not mean the perfect thing but it means something about them so it you know for me to be where i am to be able to sit back like i think dave y'all y'all like dave chappelle uh he's the goat okay well <laughs> y'all know he just did like three netflix um what are they called specials Mm-hmm. And he said something that just like really stuck out to me. He was like, you know, I did something the other day that most black men will never have the opportunity to do. Mm-hmm. I had a chance to ask myself, how do I feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> that is depressing, but it but it's so hilarious. real, right? Like it, it is was so like true. <laughs> exactly because he was like, most okay. black people are just trying to figure out how I'm gonna get what I need for my people. I don't have mm-hmm. time to sit back and think, how do I feel about that? And right. so I think that's true. I think that's the point that you're making here right. is that for a long time, you know, we haven't been able to teach each other something different and that's why a lot of times college people are the ones to break the cycle because we get to go and I mean this is privilege like yeah. it's hard to be in college it's yeah. stressful all that stuff but this is a privilege we live in a microcosm where food is provided yeah. all these things are provided we get to sit back and say I want to go to this forum where they talking about manhood and I'm yeah. going to ask myself right. how do I feel about how that how do I feel about that a lot of our you know people that came before us they didn't have the opportunity right. to do that and the funny thing is just real quick since we're talking about Maslow's hierarchy needs I actually taught that like a year ago in my stress theory and management class. But anyway, um, okay. one of the things I that- I failed them tests, though, I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> I failed all that. Well, one of the things um, that I was reminded of is that at the bottom of that hierarchy of needs, we're talking about uh, food, clothing, and shelter. Mm-hmm. And because that was the basic things that African-Americans had to worry about, that was the basic thing that defined womanhood and manhood. Because a manhood, as a provider, you only thing you need to do is provide food, clothing, and shelter. And capitalism and guarantees that for certain people. Right. right. It right. also woman, was given to us what these things were. Right. True that. And as a woman, you needed to know how to, you know, food, you need to know how to cook, clothing, you need to know how to sew and iron and do all this stuff, and shelter, you need to keep the house clean. Right. So basically, yeah. it constrains us to this defined or this limited definition. Right. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that we kind of, in this era, that's why we're so much breaking out from that is because when we're privileged to go to college, not like a lot of our parents, but when we're privileged to go to college, we see a lot of, um, we have the opportunity to really redefine what we think manhood or redefine what womanhood is. Because in today, you know, 50 years ago, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation about manhood mindset no not at all it was already already right it was already defined for you right Mm And the thing is, there were small subsets of people who were who were having these conversations. It's just that it's bigger now. Yeah, right. yeah. those subsets are bigger now. They're always, you know, like yeah, they had more barriers, I would say, than we do. Oh, definitely. Like, like def- they <laughs> had they had to run a lot. The hierarchy of needs was different. Be like we were different. But I'm just saying, like. You know, a lot of the concepts that we're talking about today aren't new. Right, They're just becoming more mainstream. Oh, man. If you really look at some of the uh, literature from the 1800s, man, we are behind the writing, the stuff that I'm yeah. reading now. They had this stuff laid out. It's yeah. just, we're repeating it. Like It's just, a, it's hierarchy of needs. It's where we right. were as a society. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nothing, and as a culture, as a people. Right. It's right. nothing new when it comes to, if you look at any empire in the history of mankind. Right. It's always... The, the peasants, the lower class, mm. they keep the economy going. Right. And the higher ups, they benefit from it because our class of people, lower class, middle class, we have to spend almost, lower class does have to spend almost everything, like damn near everything. Mm-hmm. But middle class, you know, the majority, you have to put out way more money in order to sustain your lifestyle, mm-hmm. whereas rich people do not. They, so they can sit back and you know collect whatever whatever that's it's always if you look at the roman empire you look at any empire you want to look at that's how it works right. mm-hmm. this the hierarchy the people at the top benefit from the people at the bottom giving everything that they have mm-hmm. that's just what it is and when you look at a movie even though it is a movie it's a fictional movie 
if you watch the Matrix, if you watch the entire trilogy, at the end of the movie when Neo gets to the spoiler alert. Oh my bad. No, go <laughs> ahead. And, oh, like. <laughs> off right now <laughs> but um when he gets to the end of you know to, to end this destruction that the machines are causing on the, the real world quote unquote and he gets to the um i forget what the the guy's name is they call him the computer or the master or whatever when he gets to that door he reveals to him like you're not the first you know the one to make it here like this has happened like 10 times exactly just reset itself exactly and it all starts all over again yeah so it's nothing new it's just something that our era or, or whatever has to figure out as it's been figured out before. and we're doing it more as a collective consciousness conscious together like as a society like i said you know there have always been people who've been having this conversation and you know are we raising our kids the right way are we allowing men to be this are we allowing women to be that they just have been smaller groups of people right and now it's just more mainstream you know what i'm saying um yeah i lost my train of thought no it's yeah. all g no i think i think um <clears throat> for the most part that we're talking about is a lot of our environments shape what we think manhood is and and honestly, some of the things that I've not only been raised to believe, but some of the stuff I witnessed is the men are kind of equivalent, depending on what culture you ask, is the army of that community. They're the protectors, right? They enforce like some type of discipline and things of that nature. Some people say, man, we need protection. We need more men in the neighborhood. Some of this stuff won't be going down, right? So based on what I've seen is... It's more of a military type thing that, yes, <clears throat> when you are in war, it's almost like saying somebody goes off to war in Afghanistan or something like that, or in Korea or something like that, right? And they've been in a war mindset, and our, and our identity is synonymous with trying to survive when we're literally getting bombed. Yeah. When we're literally getting mistreated and literally killed in the streets on camera, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. To the point where our mothers are even scared to send us to the store just like they're sending us to Iraq. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So now that whole mindset kind of really seeps into our whole existence, right? Yeah. And so now when we start thinking about what manhood really is, how can you come from that war zone and try to go in the family dollar like everything's all right? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. we, we really are, I think, the more candid a conversation of the the reactions to the environment i think we really don't know how much stress we're up under i think we have i won't even say normalized it mm -hmm. i think we've survived to the point where i'm not gonna say immune either i think we're just to the point where we are still here it hasn't killed us all yet mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's become a part of culture right and i don't want and and this is why I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking about that little kid listening i don't want the suffering to be a part of it Exactly. I, I, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes exactly. sometimes we can say, man, we've been through so much. And yeah. I said, but we weren't supposed to. Man, our family, we raised the kids. We, and they weren't supposed to. And it's like, like <laughs> yeah. I want you to, because we're coming to the end of the show, but I really want your thought process to take us out. Because I'm, I'm, we're listening to, not well, we're thinking about the little kid, but I'm thinking about the young woman, too. Mm -hmm. Who's like, oh, my God, they got a woman on there today. You know what I mean? And, and process? I want, yeah, heck yeah. Hey, baby girl. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I want her to leave with something just knowing that, all right, that's maybe a, a different way of thinking. Or, oh, okay, this is, all right, I ain't stupid. Somebody else is thinking like this. Because she may be in an environment mm -hmm. where somebody's not confirming her thought process. Yeah. And it was just confirmed by you tonight. Yeah. You know what I mean? However... Uh, not however, but in addition to that, I would like to say, um, well, mash out this. Y'all ever heard of the crab in the barrel mentality, correct? Yes. All right. <clears throat> um, many conversations I've had that no one really questions who put the barrel there. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hello? The crab, and honestly, with a topic of discussion, if you really look at the crab, why the crab's acting like this, we're always the topic of discussion, not only in media and literature and statistics and all that. Why are they acting like this? No one is talking about that barrel 
<laughs> that we've been thrown into. That does not. It's not the natural habitat. It's not a natural <laughs> like to be fearing for your life. It's not a natural habitat. You see what I'm saying? Uh, on, on a on a on a consistent basis, honestly. Because think about this: the stuff that our ancestors had to go through. That stuff is in our is in our is in our veins right now. Mm -hmm. If we got that same blood, that same blood wrapped around all their organs and their brain too, and we got memories, and some of us are dreaming things that we've never seen before. We having flashbacks about stuff we've never seen. <laughs> it's happening. Like we carry that stuff with us, man. So I think we gonna there's actual it. research to support exactly. <laughs> it's, it's psychological. It's psychological. Like. Uh, trauma. Yes. That Vicarious ask, trauma. Exactly. And it's passed down through, through generation. It's yes. not necessarily tradition. It's a wound. Yes. You know what I'm saying? We literally are hurting. And it's not necessarily. Generational curses. All right. That. And I think it's generational treatment. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think we just got a, I think we got a different, I just got to the point, my 98, grand, my 98 year old grandmother looked at me, she said, I wouldn't want to be y'all. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? I said, like, but you grew up in the, like, in the early, <laughs> in, the, in the 19, like, in the 30s and 40s. I'm like, you don't want to be us now? They were like, no, nah, it's so much stuff we ain't had to go through. And I'm like, whoa. Wow. I really don't even know what we're dealing with because we don't normalize it all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We may think we got it good because, you know, and this is, this is on me. I may think I got it better because I may have a vehicle. I got access to a, a, a university, a college and university. I got access to this. I got access to this. But on the outside looking in, they're looking at us like, we don't see how y'all do it. Right. Because right. access, <laughs> access don't mean you have a better It don't quality. guarantee safety. Right. Like, you can treat a, a soldier really good. You can give him caviar before you send him to the battlefield. Right. But if he's constantly, like, honestly, a lot of us are concentrating on the caviar. We don't even know we finna go right into a, a land. legitimately look me in my eyes and tell me, he likes when they're at war more so than when they're not at war because they get fed better. Wow. That's why some people want to go to jail. That's why. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like they, they feed them better food because you could die tomorrow. Wow. So they feed them better food on the regular, like when they're at war, when they're actively at war. That's I think big. also freedom can be scared if you haven't first freed your mind. Right. Because you don't know what to do with it. And the guilt, and I'm, I know we talked about a lot of guilt that's associated with progressing when you see so many of your folks <laughs> you know what i'm saying absolutely the barriers that they got to get survivors facing. remorse survivors guilt yes <laughs> all of that stuff so what i want you to do is i want you to i want you to really have our closing thought all right mm. uh some of the things that we talked about tonight and it's not like we, we like this show is just for it's literally for everybody who came in the booth hopefully people can benefit from hearing what we're talking about and then yeah. they can carry on a conversation or however they feel like mm -hmm. but uh, it's not necessarily to healing everybody because honestly we may not have that power yeah but i think we do have the power to make sure we don't keep passing down nonsense and abuse absolutely that's the only thing I we have really. a responsibility <laughs> once you know as maya say when you learn teach yeah when you get you. give yeah man like so some, we have a responsibility to pass it down yeah man it's just like look man you may can't put out fires man but put the matches down <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> don't start them. So, if you don't mind, um, yeah. talk to the young lady who is, first of all, trying to figure out what manhood is. She's trying to figure out what it is. She may have a father in her life. She may not. Mm -hmm. She may have certain images of manhood in front of her that's quite confusing. Mm -hmm. And she knows that she wants more manhood, but she is terrified of it. What would you say to her? I would tell her to go inward and first define her womanhood. Okay. First find and love herself. Okay. Um, because if you don't, I think what you attract to you will do more damage. And it will do more damage to the image of what you think manhood is and should be. Right. Um, so I would tell her to go in. I also want to speak to the point that you made earlier about mm -hmm. the little girl who may be listening and doesn't feel like she's affirmed anywhere in her thought process. Right. Um, because I was that little girl. Gotcha. So Respect talking to me um one know that you don't have to be you don't have to fit in you don't have to um people don't have to like you they don't have to agree you don't have to change who you are to be who you think you need to be um to get love it's coming keep living find your tribe find the people who beat to the same beat of your drum that's real um but at the same time hold yourself accountable um, so I don't mean to say that um, evol evolution and growth isn't important and that you shouldn't challenge yourself to think, but don't transgress against yourself. And you know when that happens. 
Mm-hmm. Everybody feels that. You feel when you go against yourself, and you also feel when you expand. So I encourage you to expand. I do not encourage you to transgress against yourself. Um, but keep living. Everybody's not meant to like you. More people, as a matter of fact, if you stand strong to who you are, more, more people will dislike you than who will like you, but they will respect you. Woo! Um, and then to the men listening. I Talk w- to us. Talk <laughs> to us. We listen. We listen. All right. Hold on. Let me get my pen out. <laughs> no, I mean, I would just say dare to dare to get to know yourself, dare to go on a journey, dare to be different, like dare to go inside and ask yourself questions, dare to define manhood for yourself, dare to be different, like so what, so what, so what and if you allow yourself to be yourself you know if you are heterosexual and cisgender and you worried about what a girl gonna think the kind of girl that you want gonna respect you for being you true that she gonna respect you for going <clears throat> and find and y'all gonna have a better relationship if you go and get you together That's so dare to be you for sure for sure um Dare to be yourself too. And make sure you don't get used for a Valentine's gift this Wednesday, <laughs> fellas. Uh, she ain't flirted with you all year, and you ain't you don't look that good t- tomorrow. Bro. Self care. <laughs> 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 it's all of that stuff. Miss Dukes, thank you so much. For, thank y'all. Um, this was fun. Most definitely. And honestly, it, won't, it shouldn't be your last time. We're going to try to incorporate more different points of view uh, as the show goes along. But we right. do understand the severity of talking about the mental health and the mental uh, process of men. Because I think across the board, we see how important it is. Mm-hmm. And, um, we, you know, this is our It's actually my favorite population to work with. That's what's up. Mm-hmm. Why, how? I mean, why, not how, but why? Um, because I know how much of a gift it is just because of the world they live in. Wow. You know, wow. like any, any black man that walks into my office, I'm automatically just like, you ain't even got to say nothing. Like, Dang. I'm just so happy you here. That's what's I'm so up. happy you gave what you need for me. Like what you need. Let me do that. Wow. Um, and not in a way to like patronize them, but I just, I'm just so happy that they get it. And I feel like they. Like seeing a soldier come home. Yeah. It's just like I'm so, I'm so happy you here. Yeah, and um, I do some deep, meaningful work. I think with black men, once we can um, kind of work past those defenses, right. and I become a safe space for them because that's what they need, or that's what people need in general is to feel like the space is safe. Then we can do some good work. Please elaborate on that. Elaborate on that. Well, before we close, uh, to the young man who is trying to figure out different excuses not to come and get help. Mm-hmm. At the, not only at your counseling center where you work at, but counseling, period. Mm-hmm. What would you tell that young man? He owes it to himself. You deserve that. Okay. Especially if it's in your fees. <laughs> Go, man. <Right. laughs> like, for real. Treat right. it like a And yet, it doesn't hurt and You literally lose nothing. You lose nothing by going. You literally right. lose nothing. You have the opportunity to gain so much right. but you literally lose nothing i will tell y'all this don't be afraid to date around when it comes to therapy just because you walk into a therapist's office doesn't mean that they automatically give you what you need and that that is the right fit for you right if you went to a doctor and you like what the doctor said what would you do go to another one. go get, get a second opinion Third, so if you go to a therapist and i don't mean you don't like what they say but you sit down and something don't feel right because you yeah. got to trust your intuition Heck yeah. if something say i don't really feel safe here this don't really feel like what i need go to the next person don't Man. be afraid to date around when it comes to therapy. If you got one of them therapists that that sound like the teacher from Everybody Hates Chris, you remember the <laughs> teacher? She was real nice, but she used to say all the racist stuff under the sun. <laughs> yeah. Like, you ain't got to say that because they got chips and cookies, man. Exactly. <laughs> like, we come with our own flaws and biases and Heck things that yeah. we bring in. Heck so, yeah. if you, even if you sit down with me and you feel like she ain't it, First of all, I want you to tell me because I need to know stuff like that. I want to keep myself accountable. But also, I'm going to tell you in my first session, get what you need. If I'm not in, I'm going to help you find it. Okay. Tell me what you need, and I'm going to help you find it. All right, good people. Let's, uh, we about to close the show. Any closing um, thoughts, announcements, all that other good stuff? And then we're going to give everybody our social media so they can follow us, too. So. Okay. Jay? Um, just some last thoughts. One thing I'm really learning is just be yourself. Right. Um. One of my favorite quotes by Oscar Wilde is be yourself because everybody else is taking it. So, um, anybody out there listening, if you doubt yourself, you're wondering, um, are you good enough? Is somebody going to accept you? 
it's not about what other people think, it's what you think about yourself. That's real. True. Same as always, man. Like like James said, be you. Be true to who you are, no pun intended. But at the same time, it is. Like, be true to who you are. Be who you are. Right. Don't be afraid to be that. Um, like he's again, like he said, you can't be anybody else. They're they're already them. Right. You know, you're uniquely you for a reason. And the more you get to know you, the more you get to love yourself and learn who you are and you'll draw that same type of energy just as they just said earlier, you know, those type of people will find their way to you. You don't have to search for it. You don't have to fight to fit in last but not least man hey you don't have to encourage people to support you because the people who support you are already doing it whatever you have to ask mm -hmm. please know that you don't got to worry about trying to record uh regroup and uh, recruit people to support your purpose in life because when they see it shining that bright they're going to draw to it and they're going to already be supporting it without even you having to put them in position big fat Straight up, yeah. man. So stop looking for friends and realize the ones you got. <laughs> because I'm telling you, when, and I, I, will, I will let you all know this. The people that demand most of your attention should be the ones that give you the most energy. Mm -hmm. I promise you this. We're going to have to stop watering the concrete and start watering the plants. Because all of these people we cutting out of our life, man, they probably were there for too long because you held on. Yep. <laughs> like straight up the people that's in our lives that want to be there who constantly support us and we ain't never we don't have that many like uh, bumps in the road no berries or something like that those are your troopers feed your troops man water the plants you ain't got to wonder what they doing cause they there mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying just just love your folks man so thank y'all so much for tuning in this is another episode of Manhood Mindset man you can follow me on Twitter, B-I-G-C-H-R-I-S-J-O-Q-E-R. -E I'm on Instagram, I'm Manhood Mindset. On Facebook, Christopher Pugh. Y'all got Instagram and all that good stuff you want to say? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, T-R-U-U-A-M-I-R. Snapchat, T-R-U-U-H-A-Y-Z-E. Um, I got social media, but I don't do social media. There so you go. if I told y'all... <laughs>